This is Don Stradley for the Film Detective, and my special guest today is April Clemmer. Now, tell me, you run a uh, interesting business called April's Old Hollywood, and you do walking tours, and you're a film buff. Uh, tell me, uh, tell me about it. I think it's something that uh, Film Detective viewers. Uh, would love to hear about, it, especially if they're ever in California, they, they'd love to uh, uh, see what you have to offer. Sure, sure. Um, so the first thing I started was the Old Hollywood walking tour. And uh, I, I got to be sort of known as this person who was really into classic Hollywood. And so one day I was asked to do a, a research project on old theaters in the Hollywood area. And when I did that, I, you know, you're digging and building permits and all kinds of things that are super exciting to me, but maybe not to other people. But, uh, you know, I was really getting into it and I found all these cool places that were sort of firsts in Hollywood along this little about six block stretch of Hollywood Boulevard. It is along the Walk of Fame, but not a lot of people go there or I see them wandering about in that area sort of wondering what they're supposed to be <laughs> impressed by or looking at and so uh, some of that research turned into what is now the old Hollywood walking tour. And generally how how long is a, a, a walking tour? Do, do you take these people out for a couple of hours or <laughs> how, how long does it last? And, and what, what kind of, of things will they see on this walking tour? Yeah, I, I find that no matter how fascinating something is, uh, the limit is gonna be an hour and a half to two hours. <laughs> so I, I try to keep uh, the just regular old Hollywood walking tour under, uh, and it's around an hour to an hour and a half, just depending on the speed of the group. And uh, for private tours, sometimes I'll extend that out if there are other things they're interested in. That can be a little longer. But really, I think the limit of any tour um, that's a walking tour should be a couple of hours. And we see all kinds of interesting things. Uh, there are locations of places that aren't there anymore. There are locations that are remnants of these old cool theaters that used to be very active. Uh, we talk about the oldest restaurant in Hollywood. We see the oldest remaining home in Hollywood. And we talk about things like what the first tourist attraction was, how the movies came to Hollywood, and what Hollywood was originally supposed to be and why it is so different. And you know what, this, it was this, this little tiny town. And I have this thing I say that uh, is a little t cheesy tagline that, you know, this is how Hollywood went from a tiny town to tinsel town, but it's really true. It, it really was this little kind of middle of nowhere and in less than a hundred years, it became the film capital of the world. And it's a very interesting story. And that is the story I tell on the tour. Now, April, what is the difference between your old Hollywood walking tour and a private tour? A private tour, you are, going to get to see more. Uh, I will spend a little more time delving into some stories that maybe I don't have as much time to get into on the walking tour. And I always like to find out what a client's specific interest is. If there's a specific decade, if they're really into old theaters, uh, if there's a star that they're into. And I'll try to incorporate some things like that that maybe wouldn't normally be on the regular tour. And then also you have somebody that is completely at your disposal to take you up and down um, the Walk of Fame and Hollywood Boulevard because it it's an overwhelming place. Some things have been preserved, some things have not. And uh, I really think you, you kind of need, especially if you're... Uh, new to town, you need somebody to sort of guide you through the craziness that can be Hollywood Boulevard and show you what's really special. Now, before you created your own uh, Hollywood walking tour, uh, there must have been other similar tours. Did you ever go on one of those tours and, and think you could uh, do something similar or, or maybe put your own spin on it? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I, uh, the, the old Hollywood walking tour, as I said, it came out of 
all of this research that I, I did, and I did it for a community organization, uh, a business improvement district called the Hollywood Partnership. And I turned over uh, all of this extra stuff I had found to them beyond what they were, what they were looking for, because that little area of Hollywood Boulevard that I mentioned, it gets the least amount of attention. And so as a community organization, they were wanting something to make that area shine. And so I turned this in and one of them said, you know, this would be a great walking tour. And I said, I would be happy to write that for you. And then I turned it in and they said, okay, well, when do you want to start? And I said, I'm, I'm not giving a walking tour. <laughs> uh, the, the term tour guide on Hollywood Boulevard, I feel like can have a negative connotation. Uh, you know, I think of, you know, there are a lot of people that are out there hustling, you know, chasing you down with a brochure, trying to force you into a van and maps to the like, stars homes. Yeah, yeah, that just wasn't my style, but they convinced me that I could kind of do it my way. Um, so I dress up in period evocative attire, uh, not really a costume per se. Um, but just kind of a nice, you know, maybe 40s sort of look. And I want to create an experience that is as, as elegant as you can have on Hollywood Boulevard. I have archival photos that I'm able to show of some of the locations. We do have one interior stop where we go into this gorgeous vintage office building and, uh, I made sure that, you know, there would be a restroom stop, you know, a place for water and snacks and things like that. So I want people to be really comfortable and to be impressed by the experience. So it, it really is not your typical uh, tourist kind of uh, arrangement. It sounds like you're taking people sort of off the, the beaten path a little bit. Yeah, and that's what's so fun about it is I get people who are totally into old Hollywood and then maybe they've dragged along you know their their friend to come with them that's not that into old movies but there's a little bit on the tour for everyone it's it's not just fact-based I'm not just showing you a building and telling you who the architect was and the year it was built you know I'm telling you an interesting story about a shop that was there or an interesting story that happened in this location and I think storytelling uh, is, is attractive to everyone. And that's really what Hollywood is all about. And so I try to make telling Hollywood's story what the tour is about. Now, uh, I know that you're a, a serious uh, lover of, of old films. Uh, is this something that started when you were very young? When, when did you realize that uh, you were a, a classic film buff? Well, I really got into watching old films um i didn't i didn't grow up with it because my family was they weren't really into classic hollywood i'm from the middle of nowhere in georgia and so uh when i got older i was interested in acting and i was interested in the stories of people who had been successful because they're for uh, actors so many books and workshops and things that you can do that tell you how to make it in the business but if all of that really worked, everybody would be famous and they're not. So I thought, what are the stories about people who made it big and what, you know, what is their work like? And so that's what really got me into studying uh, classic film and classic Hollywood. Yeah, it is pretty irresistible reading about the, uh, the early days of, of Hollywood. Um, what, what do you think uh, the movie business had back then that it might not have now? I think it had, uh, obviously there was an element of, of glamour about it. Uh, there was a control over the image of the stars. Uh, the way the movies were presented was totally different in these big, gorgeous movie houses. So going to the movies was really an experience. Uh, I also think that the studio system, you know, is, I think it was really great in some ways and, you know, maybe not so great in other ways, but they really had a formula for responding to what the public wanted and giving them that. And I think that that is, they, they built up stars and, you know, Joan Crawford said, you know, the, the public made me a star and, and she was really, Right, like she was in a mold and 
you know, MGM really knew kind of what to do with her and what her public liked, but she also played the part of a star and she embraced that. And I think a lot of movie stars did that back then. They felt they owed something to their fans. Yeah, one thing that always interests me about uh, that the studio era is that if you were going to a Warner Brothers movie, you knew what it would be like. You had a sense, you know, Warner Brothers delivered a certain kind of movie. Yeah. MG, MGM delivered a, a certain kind of movie, you know, and, and that's kind of in, interesting to me. Universal, you know, their movies all kind of had the same look and, and, and obviously the same actors uh, and you, you, you knew what you were getting. And in a way, to me, that's kind of repeated now uh, with the networks. If, if HBO produces a program, you know what it's gonna look like. <laughs> you, you can almost predict what the music is going to sound like, you know. Uh, same thing if, if it's a Netflix original, you know, it has its own kind of uh, fingerprint, you know. Um, so uh, it's almost like the TV or the, those little networks that produce their own uh, projects. Uh, I, I guess it's inevitable that, that uh, they, all, they all put their own stamp on it. Um, yeah, and I think too, like that with along with the point that you're making, um, those, there's some variety there. Uh, you know, if you like certain genres, you can find something on those networks. And I'm not sure movies on the big screen offer that kind of variety in the same way today. So I think people are going to streaming services more for that now. An another thing that's kind of interesting about that old studio system is that you would loan out uh, one of your stars. You know, Richard Widmark is on loan from Fox, you know, and he's making a movie for another studio. And in a way that was, uh, that was news, that was publicity, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that, that was kind of intriguing to me as well. Um, on, on your tour, do you ever uh, touch on any of the, uh, the darker aspects of Hollywood? Any of that Hollywood Babylon type of uh, crime and murder, any, any, anything like that? Or do you just stick to the, the glamor and, and the fun stuff? I, I like to say I stick to the truth <laughs> and keep it as accurate as possible, but it does, uh, there's really not that much on the tour that's dark and, okay. and, and negative. Um, I say really in-depth exploration of, of topics like that for uh, something I do, um, which is more the April's Old Hollywood thing that I mentioned. I need to find a name and just combine the Old Hollywood walking tour with this other thing. But I offer Zoom presentations once a month. And so people who maybe aren't close by but are interested in classic Hollywood can hop on and I'll talk about a specific topic. And it has given me a lot of flexibility in terms of I can't do a walking tour of everywhere in the city you know or or a person but I can do you know I can pull archival photos and put together a presentation about you know the Knickerbocker Hotel has been a really popular one that I've done and there were some dark things that happened there so you know we can explore that more in that type of format. Now, uh, I know that you're very interested in uh, historic preservation. T talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, for historic preservation, I, you, you look at, you know, classic Hollywood and, you know, you've got an audience that is inherently interested in history. And so they come to Hollywood and they want to see where the stars went or they, you know, I'll get asked, where can I go have dinner that's going to be an old Hollywood experience? Or do they have, you know, those cafes where people, you know, used to go and there were floor shows and people are craving that. And when we, we live in a city that moves very quickly, you know, we're, and that's just the nature of being a huge urban center uh, in the United States. But I think we have to be careful to preserve the reason uh, that people often come here in the first place. And I'm a big believer in something called adaptive reuse, which is taking, you know, a historic building, making it, you know, maybe, maybe it can't 
be functional as a theater anymore, but perhaps you can turn it into, you know, a restaurant, but you can pay homage to the, the fact that it has this rich history. And I think we can take clues from the past. I would love to see somebody open up a replica of like a Schwab's drugstore mm -hmm. in Hollywood or an old soda fountain counter. And I think people come here and they want to see that kind of thing and, and it's just lacking. So yeah, I think keeping the history that we still have left is, is really important. And I don't think it can be a hindrance to development. I think it can be complementary of the development. So if you know we can all work together instead of just fighting about it, I think there are solutions for preserving history and for you know development in Hollywood. As long as they don't try to turn it into some kind of uh, you know Johnny Rockets or one of those uh, <laughs> nostalgia uh, no, I mean, nostalgia no, diners. I just think. Um, you know, people don't come to Hollywood to go to a chain restaurant they could go to in their hometown. And I think, you know, we're responsible for offering them this unique kind of glamorous experience. Everybody would love to have that kind of thing as opposed to, you know, just getting into Hollywood and then being able to shop at a store that maybe is at the mall at your hometown. You know, they want to they want to look at Hollywood stuff. So. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice to go in and have a, you know, a, a hat check, you know, and, and uh, oh. all that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, there is a building in Hollywood that was the home to the Cafe Montmartre, which was Hollywood's mm -hmm. first nightclub. And it's still there. Uh, it was on the second floor of a building. So the, the first floor, I believe now is activated, but they're not, I don't know, they're not doing anything that I can tell with that second floor. But I thought, how cool if someone wanted to come in to Hollywood and open a nightclub and we said you know instead of opening the exact same nightclub that anyone could go to anywhere in the world perhaps you do this kind of twist on it where you know maybe a couple of nights it has a classic Hollywood theme or one night you do you know an old-fashioned floor show and that doesn't have to be dated you can do something modern but you know what amazing advertising is you know Hollywood's first nightclub is back, you know, since uh, I believe it opened in 1922. But I just think collaborating uh, with historians uh, and developers to come up with those kinds of ideas could make for some really exciting attractions in Hollywood that we don't have right now. And, and just think of, you know, you might be giving, uh, you know, work to, uh, you know, singers or, or, you know, musicians who could come in and, and uh, you know, play once or twice a week, you know, entertain, you know, oh, I think that, that would be dynamic. I, I'd love to see something like that. I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, bringing back Schwab's. Um, and now uh, uh, another thing to talk about was some, um, you know, you, you mentioned your, your uh, the old Hollywood backroom membership. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so that came, uh, it was kind of a, a COVID silver lining, if you will. Uh, when I, when the COVID started, I couldn't give in-person tours. And so that's where the idea to do these different presentations on Zoom came from. And I did the tour presentation a couple of times and I realized some of the same people were showing up, but maybe I should change up the subject so <laughs> for them to keep coming back. And I did, and I would see the same names signing up. And I thought, who are these people? Like, I want to talk to them. I want to get to know them. They're interested in the same thing that I'm interested in. And, you know, there's only so much I can tell my friends and family about old Hollywood before their eyes glaze over. So I thought I'd really get to know these people. And so I hosted a couple of virtual cocktail hours just to kind of test the waters and see if it's something people would be interested in and ultimately created this membership. And it's a way for classic Hollywood fans to connect with each other. They, uh, they have access to anything that I do. And then I do some special things for them a couple of times a month where maybe we'll have an author on or somebody connected with classic Hollywood and have a chat. Uh, I might do a special presentation that's just for them. Um, 
we've done a few in-person things, but really the membership, um, I want it to be open to everyone. I don't want it to just be bound by, you know, living in Los Angeles because a lot of people don't live close by or maybe, you know, can't get out here for an in-person social, but we can, we've done a lot of fun things on Zoom. I know people, everybody says people are Zoomed out or sick of it, but when it's the right crowd, I think it can be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think Zoom is here to stay. Talk, talk about the benefits of COVID. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, uh, for these virtual events that you host, uh, how can someone get involved in that? Can they contact you through your website, aprilclemmer.com? Yes, they can uh, go to the website and uh, there's a way to contact me there. Um, my email is april at aprilclemmer.com. So it's just my name, Clemmer spelled with a C. And then my uh, social media handles are all April's Hollywood. So you can send me a DM there. Uh, so lots of different ways to, to get in touch with me, but uh, April's Hollywood on social media is pretty good. And then email, I always love to get emails from people. Well, I'll send you one. Um, and so, <laughs> when, uh, so when they contact you, uh, you you then do what? Do you send them a schedule of, of what uh, events might be coming up and and links or or what, what's that next step like? Yeah, I would I would just respond back and you know if they mention something specific in their email that they're interested in, I would send them links for that um, or whatever information that they were asking for. But yeah, probably in the form of a link so they could go ahead and you know read about the next event see if it's something they want to be a part of and uh, get registered for that. Well, now th that's, that all sounds really intriguing. And, 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 and I'm surprised there isn't more, uh, you know, more people uh, doing what, what you do. You know, uh, it, it, it seems like it's just such a big, juicy, you know, potential. Um, all, you know, corners of, of LA, you know, cor cor New York, Las Vegas, you know, there, there are, it, it could be done uh, all over the place. Um, so it, it's, it's great that you're, you're carving out this for yourself. Let, let's talk about movies for a minute. Um, who, who are some of your favorite uh, performers or, or favorite movies that, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you, you, lo you like to read about or talk about? Uh, well, I love uh, silent actresses. I love, I think my comedian would be Marion Davies. And um, I love Gloria Swanson. I just love reading about her and just the big personality she had. Um, she's really fascinating to me. Uh, everybody loves Marilyn. Uh, I always think Carol Lombard would have been someone I would love to have been friends with. Um, Lana Turner, I think, is really interesting. You know, she's somebody that everybody thinks of as just, oh, she was lucky. But yeah, she was lucky that she got discovered, you know, in a in a soda um, soda shop. But you don't have the kind of career longevity that she had uh, from being lucky. So her career is very interesting to me. Uh, Clark Gable is is my heartthrob personally. <laughs> so. <laughs> A lot of movies connected with them, and I can't not mention Jean Harlow. Mm -hmm. She's so wonderful and and so natural in her films, and those are films that I can watch over and over again, and they just warm my heart and make me feel good. Interesting that you mentioned uh, Gloria Swanson. Uh, there are so many interesting clips of her on the Dick Cavett Show. Yes, <laughs> on on uh, on YouTube. And, and uh, she just looks like this tiny little, um, uh, almost uh, uh, steely, like, like there's something about her, it looks like she's made of steel, you know, um, very, very tough, but not, you know, not, not uh, in an obvious way. Um, but I, I, I'm intrigued by Gloria Swanson too. Uh, the, the, obviously Sunset Boulevard was the movie that I, I knew from before I knew her, I knew that movie, you know, because uh, it was such a, a late night kind of classic. 
Um, but over the years, I, I started uh, learning more about her. I, I, I know what you mean. She is intriguing. Um, and especially that so many of her films have been lost. Yeah, and that breaks my heart about so many people. You know, you think about uh, Theta Barra mm -hmm. and, you know, there's almost nothing to watch, you know, and- Yeah, you, you just have to go by the still photos <laughs> and, and, I, and assume that, you know, she really was the vamp. <laughs> yeah, and, and I know, uh, you know, for me, Valentino, I think, is so much better to watch in a film. Like you really get his appeal watching him in motion more than you do in a still. So for Theta Barra, you know, I always think about, you know, we kind of miss what the audience has got to see that made her so appealing during that time period. Yeah, there, there was a great book about Theta Barra uh, a few years ago. I don't know if you've ever uh, had a chance to read it, but uh, it was a pretty well, pretty thorough uh, book. Maybe 10 or 12 years ago it came out and I, I can't think of the author's name. I have one called Vamp. I think that's probably it with the, with the great cover. Yeah, uh, yeah. Her, all in black, I think. Um, but yeah, she it made her out to sound like she was a bit mystified by uh, some of the attention or all of the attention, you know. Um, but she was uh, she was a real interesting character. I always said that there was, you know, occasionally they make movies about uh, the old stars. You know, they, they've they've recycled the Betty Davis, Joan Crawford story. Oh, <laughs> and and, and uh, you know, every so often they, they do a Marilyn Monroe movie or something, a Lucille Ball. And I'm thinking, you know, the vamp. We, we, we need to see the uh, the Theta Berra story brought <laughs> brought back um but I mean, it would be difficult but it'd be interesting yeah well there's so much good stuff in that story you know she's this kind of regular girl from ohio that somehow gets a you know, gets a contract and they create this whole identity for her and just i would love to see the scene that i've read about where she does the big press conference and there's incense burning and it's Mm. 100 degrees outside but she's got you know she's draped in velvet and you know they have this whole a very exotic scene set and then as soon as it's over i think the last reporter out of the room saw her kind of push through the curtains and run to the window and say god give me some air you know <laughs> so just you know watching those people play the roles assigned to them in their real life <laughs> such a great great film premise yeah, and, and uh, yeah, what you said is true. Not only were you assigned to play, you know, Cleopatra, or, or you were assigned to play the vamp, you were assigned to play Theta Barra. You know, yeah. you, you, you had to play that role every day. And I, and I think it wore her down. I, I, I think, because uh, uh, her career really petered out kind of quickly, didn't it? Uh, yeah, I, you know, she was really, passe you know i think even before silence ended yeah yeah it might have you know might have been four or five years yeah at you, know, at you know where her name really registered a lot and then, and then almost uh, really quickly people kind of either she lost interest in, in the business or the public uh, got tired of, of the vamp um, yeah i think she was killed by the flapper <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there, there seemed to be a big change in movies in the middle of the silent era, you know, that, that period from like 1916, and you can almost uh, measure it by Charlie Chaplin's career, where, mm -hmm. you know, he started out with very short movies, the one reelers, and his films got progressively bigger, and then everybody was jumping on that bandwagon, and all movies started becoming epics, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think of the silent era in two, two chapters, the, the, you know, that 1916 to 1921 type period. And, and then yeah. from about the time of uh, the kid, <laughs> what was that, 1920? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the kid to, uh, you know, the jazz singer. That, that, <laughs> that's the second era, you know, where every, things just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and, and more, more extravagant. 
Um, and I think she was part of that first period um, because e even her big films were, were smallish in comparison to what was to come, you know? Oh, yeah. It was just, the, the business was growing in such leaps and bounds, you know? And I think, I think uh, maybe, maybe the business outgrew her too. Um, but uh, I, would, I, would, I don't know who would play her. Um, nobody really looks like her anymore. You know, you, you could dress someone up as the vamp, you know, um, but, uh, you know, she had kind of roundish features and, mm -hmm. and, and big, big round eyes. And they used to put the, a lot of black <laughs> oh, you know, around her eyes to make them even rounder, you know. Um, so she, she looked almost like this nocturnal character staring yeah. out. <laughs> Kiss me, my fool. Yeah, she was something. I, I, I enjoy reading about her. You don't get to see much of it, like you said. Um, and and uh, you, you also mentioned uh, Clark Gable. Um, what, uh, what, what are some of your Clark Gable movies? Do you like the pre-code stuff where he was, you know, a bad boy or do you like him a little bit older and more sophisticated or? Oh, you know, I love it all. Uh, I think the pre-codes are interesting, particularly that he has a year that, he became Clark Gable you know most people sort of build and build and you know they're a little known before their breakout but like 1931 was like the year of Clark Gable you know and they had paired him with you know all of the big leading ladies and he kind of changed the the leading man from more that Valentino Latin lover type to sort of this rough and tumble kind of guy yeah, he looked, he, Gable looked like his hands were dirty. Yeah. You know, no, no matter what role he was playing, he, he could be playing a, you know, a, a politician or, or a newspaper editor. And he looked like he had dirty hands. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love his, I love his pairings with um, Gene Harlow. I think that those are some of my favorite Clark Gable films. Yeah, I was watching uh, one the other night. Um, Blonde Crazy with uh, Cagney. Uh huh. And uh, I, I, Joan Blondell, I think, was uh, opposite him. I think. Um, and and I, I don't know if you're familiar with that movie, but uh, it was interesting because I think Cagney had already done uh, Public Enemy. Uh huh. It came out, it came out the same year. Um, and so I could tell that they were trying to maybe lighten him up a little bit mm -hmm. uh so he you know could be portrayed not just as a scary tough guy but you know maybe do some comic type turns <laughs> but he was still scary in it that was what was interesting to me was that uh even though it was kind of like a uh a, a, a comedy about this guy and his girlfriend who were scamming people um he he, he seemed scary to me there was just something about Cagney <laughs> Something in his eyes, he looked like he could go off at any minute, you know. Um, and, and I think it took a few years for him to lose that. Uh, I, and I, maybe he had to be dancing and singing to totally lose, <laughs> you know, to, to lose that scary side. Um, but uh, I like uh, Barbara Stanwyck, too. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, especially when she was really young, doing those uh, almost post-flapper type roles yeah yeah her pre-code stuff is fun to watch yeah and i love uh, i love fireball or, or, or ball of fire yeah what is it? fireball or ball of fire Ball of fire yeah yeah that's that that's uh I, I like that one um it's almost like snow white and the seven dwarfs <laughs> you know she's <laughs> she you know she's the uh, the burlesque dancer who's hiding out in this house full of professors you know they very <laughs> They are very much like the seven dwarves, you know, following her around and trying trying to, you know, look I after her. I love that analogy. <laughs> and and uh, where do you stand on Gary Cooper? Oh, he's so sexy. He really is. And um, High Noon is. Uh... Yeah, he he was an he was an interesting character because. Uh, he was uh, almost, he started in the silent era, didn't he? He, he? His first few movies were in the silent period. 
And to me, a lot of his early sound movies, he looks like he's still in a silent movie almost. He's still kind of almost posing, you know, and, and that may have been the director working with him too, because the directors were still kind of thinking that they were making silent films and they were kind of working in the same, uh, you know, same motions, and, um, same, same kind of angles, same kind of shots. You had a lot of, uh, a lot of, of uh, Gary Cooper's early sound films where he's almost like a statue. Yeah, he's very much a, a presence and, yeah. you know, some people can kind of command attention by just their just stillness and it somehow makes you want to watch them you you just wonder what like what's going on under there you know and he's that type of actor for me yeah on on your on your tours uh do, do uh any of the actors that we uh, have been talking about, do, do you have anything that, uh, like, do you go past, uh, you know, do you go past Gloria Swanson's house? Do you do anything like that? Yeah. Or, or, you know, do, do you go past the, uh, the store where Gary Cooper bought his hats or anything like that? Uh, there's, a, there's a few little spots. Um, most of it on the uh, regular old Hollywood walking tour have to do with more silent films mm -hmm. because that uh, area where I do the tour was a real hot spot for filming silent films. We also talk about um, Musso and Frank and some of the celebrities that were at that uh, restaurant, which is the oldest one in Hollywood. And on the, the private tour or in like an extended version of a tour, uh, we do go by that nightclub that I talked about earlier where a lot of the stars would go and hang out. And then uh, I try to include the Chinese theater on that mm -hmm. extended private tour. And I don't care what you say about stuff in Hollywood being cheesy. The Chinese theater forecourt is just so cool and it never gets old. <laughs> and I think just standing there and looking at just that, that roster in cement of, of film greats is always fascinating. Oh sure, that's iconic. Not nothing cheesy about it. Now you had mentioned earlier, and I wanted to get back to this. You said something about uh, the first tourist attraction in Hollywood. Uh, can, can you can you tell me what that is? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, so Hollywood was, you know, founded as sort of a suburb of Los Angeles, and the people that founded it had this vision of it being kind of a they wanted some sort of cultural element there and uh so i think they were always sort of searching for that and there was in ar around 1900 uh they started to build something called the delong prey garden and it was at the corner of hollywood and Cahuenga. another big reason they wanted to put it there was because they were laying the trolley lines uh for a tour that would run from downtown to beaches. And uh, Dida Wilcox, uh, who managed a lot of the land holdings in Hollywood, really wanted those trolley tracks to run through Hollywood. And so she met up with this French watercolor artist named Paul Delongpre. He talked about how he would love to live in Hollywood. He painted flowers. So she came up with this idea to create uh, something that is almost like what the Huntington Gardens or the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina is, but it was in Hollywood. It was a huge garden estate with a grand house uh, where Paul DeLongpre, the artist, lived. And it was acres and acres of space right in the middle of Hollywood. This is before film, so these kinds of attractions were very popular. And people would buy a ticket, they could go in and tour the gardens, they could tour the first floor of DeLongpre's home, which was set up like a gallery. Uh, if they were lucky, they might catch him painting in one of the gazebos on the property. And that was a really big tourist attraction. I have this old book um, that came out around 1938 called The History of Hollywood. And it has all these tables and numbers and stats in the back and it has like thousands and thousands of people coming through 
this garden estate every year and that really put hollywood on the map before movies did and what is interesting is that that lasted until 1911 uh that's the year delong Frey passed away and 1911 is the year that hollywood gets its first movie studio and so it's interesting it's like hollywood kind of is this artist town and then he you know 1911 the torch gets passed to like what's going to be the new art form of that century with film so i love that parallel and that hollywood always kind of had this attraction for artists even before the movies were here that sounds nice now you do you uh, you still have family back in georgia I do, yes. And what, what do they think of this? Do they think, oh, April has gone Hollywood? What, what do they think about these tours? The, oh, they think I'm crazy. <laughs> but no, my, they, my, uh, my family is really supportive of the tours. That's something they can understand. I think more so than me just driving across the country to be an actor. I think uh, a tour is, it's a business. It's something that exist in other places and not just Hollywood. And so I think that they're a lot more comfortable with me having a tour business than you're, ma you're making a living. You're pulling <laughs> yes, your own way. An honest living. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's great. Well, we've been on uh, long enough, I think. It's been great talking to you. Anything else you want to share? Anything else? Uh, other ways to contact you? We've got uh, aprilclemmer.com. Uh, get in touch if you'd like to be involved with uh, April's old Hollywood backroom membership, learning about Hollywood and old Hollywood style. Uh, it looks like you're, a, you're a, just a wealth of information and I think your tour is a lot of fun. I'm on the other side of the country, so it's not like I can uh, come out and see it, but it sounds awesome. It really does. Uh, best of luck. Um, Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks and for having me. maybe we'll have you on again. You never know. Oh, I'd love it. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, yeah, get in touch with me. Um, and uh, I love people's ideas as well. So, uh, you know, one of those places, aprilclimmer.com, uh, April's Hollywood on social. If you have something about old Hollywood that you want to know about, send it over to me and I'll do my best to dig around for you. <laughs> there you have it. You've heard it. I'm Don Stradley for the film detective. My guest is April Clemmer. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.